Fun Part 2 finally hits theaters this weekend. I have been excited for this movie ever since the credits started rolling on the first movie. It was one of my most anticipated movies of last year. Obviously, it got delayed, but I have finally seen it, so let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your thoughts on Dune Part 2, and give me that point of reference. Have you read the book? What did you think about the first film? All of that fun stuff. As for me, I have not read the book, but I was a massive fan of Dune Part 1. But I even said in my review, I'm going to give it an A-, minus. but as soon as they greenlight the sequel, I'm going to give this one an A-, but it's a tough movie to fully evaluate because it is so clearly a part one and this is the setup movie and the ability of the sequel to pay it all off will kind of determine how well I think about the first film in history. So did part two make part one even better? I'll tell you in just a second. First off, today's video is brought to you by Factor. In the last month alone, I went to Florida, then I went to Phoenix, I did some public speaking. I like to eat healthy, but I don't have a lot of time to prep healthy meals. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. You get pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. No prep, no mess, Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. You'll have over 35 options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie plus, and more. There's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. I like their protein smoothies to kick off the day with some protein. It's also flexible for your schedule. You can get as little or as much as you need from six to 18 meals per week, and you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Head to factormeals.com slash seanchandler50 and use code seanchandler50 to get 50% off. That's code seanchandler50 at factormeals.com slash seanchandler50 to get 50% off. The link is down below in the description, and let's get started with the good. As I said in my introduction, my long-term feelings about part one were kind of dependent on whether or not part two was able to deliver. I'm very happy to say part two absolutely delivers on every single front. This movie takes everything that was great about part one and just builds on top of it. If part one had the burden of delivering all of the exposition, introducing us to all of the characters, tribes, conflicts, competing values. That means part two just gets to move the story forward and build this incredible narrative on top of it. This is grown-up sci-fi. It's not playing to the lowest common denominator. It's not dumbing everything down for the broadest possible audience. In a world where we have so many middle-of-the-road, gigantic-budget blockbusters, Dune Part 2 is the counterbalance uh, to blockbuster mediocrity. <laughs> On almost every single level, you look at this movie and you go, there, that's what we want. With all that said, let's kind of dive into all, each of the specific parts of this movie and why it is so good. And let's start things off talking about the story. Now, I haven't read the book, as I mentioned before, but the book has had the reputation for a very long time of being extremely difficult to translate into film because it is so dense and so large in scale. So to pull it off properly, you need a big budget to do it. But because it's so layered, it's not the most accessible story that's easy to translate into a blockbuster that will sell a lot of tickets. So how do you do that? Well, you get one of the absolute best filmmakers of our time and you let him do his thing and allow him to tell the story across a pair of different very long films. Actually, the movie's only like two hours and 40 minutes long. In a world where James Cameron is putting out three hour and 15 minute long blockbusters, two hours and 40 minutes, eh, it's not that bad. But what the movie does so well is that it introduce, introduces us to all of these different groups and factions and characters that have different 
values, different motivations, different skills, and it just weaves this web of conflicts where it's almost never as simple as just two people competing over one thing. The reason why these two people are clashing really matters, but they're both being manipulated by this group over here, but this group is actually being manipulated by this group over here, and it just makes everything have layers to it. There's always a second perspective on it. It's never easy to look at a situation and say, this is right, this is wrong, this is the good guy, this is the bad guy, and here is why. You don't know who you can trust. You don't know precisely what their motivation is, so you don't know exactly what they're working towards and why. So in every scenario, you're trying to pay attention to the details and figure out what, what are we working towards and why. Kind of right along these exact same lines, the characters all have a like this complexity to them. Paul is, in some ways, our, our classic hero, the chosen one, the leader that is leading the rebellion against the oppressors. Now, Dune, of course, was written a long time ago, but we've had many movies inspired by that and inspired by Dune play that out. But Paul is by no means the classic hero. He's a, a reluctant hero. He has many good characteristics, but he also has many bad characteristics. He's conflicted. He has noble traits, and there's ways in which he's not power-hungry like so many other people. And then there's other moments where you see a manipulative side come out of him where he will use people to achieve his goals and exploit their weaknesses for his ends. And so our, our hero, we're rooting for him. We're behind him, and there's these moments of success and victory where the music swells, and it's so satisfying and emotionally resonant, but it's also never quite as simple as he's just the good guy. But everybody feels fleshed out, and we'll get into this when we get into the world building a little bit more, and we already kind of touched on this with all the groups and their different motivations, but even the way everyone relates to Paul is based off their ties to whatever faction they're affiliated with, their belief system, as well as their personal relationship with Paul. They feel like actual multidimensional people with all sorts of conflicting emotions and ideas inside of their head. Another fun standout here was Austin Butler as one of our, our Harkonnen people who's supposed to be just one of the most vicious characters in the entire film. When you're seeing this guy that we saw as Elvis just a couple years back, and then we see him in this movie, you immediately realize this, this guy's going to be around a long time, and this guy can do whatever he wants. <laughs> if he can be Elvis, and that fun and energetic, and then this menacing and intense and creepy, this is a guy with range that commits to roles. That's what makes this film so magnetic that it sucks you in because everything is so developed in each piece, whether a character, a plot point, a faction, a piece of technology ties into this grander world. But other thing you have to really dive into when it comes to the characters in this film and the story, so much of it is built around its treatment of the hero's journey in this film where Paul is our chosen one of sorts. And in certain senses, it's a classic hero's journey with the unexpected leader that fulfills the prophecy, leads the re rebellion, and it hits a bunch of the beats that you're supposed to have in your classic hero's journey. But also, it is very much not a classic hero's journey. It takes all the elements, the prophecy, the religious ties, and it, and it plays that out as a way to manipulate people, as a way to evoke emotion from the audience. You don't believe in who you are. I believe I matter to these people. This is subversion done right. It feels much more like the writers and storytellers are smarter than me. They deliver everything that I want from this type of film but to find a way to turn it on its head, play it out in unexpected ways that are interesting and satisfying. And that'll lead into the next thing you just have to talk about with this film, the world building. And 
a lot of times when we talk about world building, we think of the big picture side to it of building out, you know, these distant planets in the future and the politics of it all. World building done right, it's not just the big stuff. It gets down to into all the little details of making this distant world seem believable and real and lived in. The book is a lot about the influence of the environment on the psyche of character, on the culture. If you want to know about the Fremen, you look at the desert. And one of the great examples of that in both of these films is the treatment of water in the desert where you have the water suit. So that's kind of classic world building. Oh, they're in a desert, so let's give them a piece of tech that provides them with water. But to the Fremen who don't have a lot of water, Water is pivotal to everything that they do. So when they kill someone, they want to get the water out of their body. When they see someone cry, they respond so differently to water leaving someone's body. When they hear stories about distant planets with lakes and oceans, it feels like this fantasy dream world to them because they can't fathom water in such large supply. There's a shot in the first movie where one of those little rabbit mouse creatures is hopping around and just kind of zooms in, you're just looking at it and a you know, drop of sweat comes out of its ear and goes down its face and then it goes into its mouth and it drinks it. And it's, it's such a small detail, but that's world building because on this planet, water is so scarce, but so pivotal to life that everything about the creatures that live in this desert is about maintaining water. And that's the attention to detail in the world building here that makes everything compelling and interesting. There's a backstory for everything. Another just kind of example of it that was a little bit more creative and interesting and more kind of overt is we go to the Harkonnen planet and they have like this black sun. Came with this idea that the sunlight will uh, be monochromatic, black and white. And so when you're outside, it goes into black and white. And, but when you're indoors, there's a little bit more color to it. And there's like a section in here where there's like a fireworks display outside, but different technology. So instead of feeling like particles exploding, it plays like a splash in the sky as a firework, but in this context where the light outside is black and white. And he, he brought himself the idea of uh, infrared cameras. Uh, in order to shoot this, which will bring it uh, black and white, that the skin will become translucent, milky, and you will see the veins of the character, and the eyes will be suddenly very percy and like reptilian. And we've all seen a thousand things that are in black and white. Black and white is not interesting, but because of the world building, because of the reason we're seeing black and white, and the way that we'll step outside and it's black and white, step inside and it slowly starts to saturate again, all of a sudden, this is one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time. Like, you want to spend more time there just to see the imagery and all the different rules of how this plays out. And uh, quite a unique look for, for Giddy Prime, but it was, there was no way back from that. I warned the, the, the studio then that there will be, it, it will be black and white like that. They were, we, we could not bring back the color. I love to do things on camera. That is world building done right and done in an interesting way that makes you want to see and experience more. But the final piece in all of this is the actual production. And the reason so much of this works is the same amount of detail that is put into the characters, into the small moment by moment details of world building is also put into the technical production. This movie, from start to finish, is filled, filled with absolutely perfect visuals that are entirely convincing. This movie will be the point of reference to criticize bad VFX for the years to come. This movie cost $190 million. That's a lot, but it looks perfect. And while $190 million is a lot... It's less than $200 million. And we have all these blockbusters coming out. It costs 220, 250, $310 million. And they don't look nearly as good as Dune. 
And I've been doing this deep dive into all the special features on the Blu-ray for the first film as all, all sorts of interviews and videos on the internet about why the effects look so real. But they, they did the hard work of taking each one of these pieces of tech and figuring out what do you need to do to make this look believable? And so if we want to have these dragonfly type wings on our shuttles, let's study dragonflies and let's figure out how do we do the motion blur just right. And so you see it and you can tell when it's going faster and slower based off the motion blur, which is language most of us don't have. We're not thinking about it, but our eyes can see it and understand it because they put the details into it. They studied different way that sand moves in order to be able to create a physical model of some of these effects that they were doing. And of course it's augmented by CGI, but they start with something real, something that actually happens in reality and build on top of that. So we have sand doing something sand actually does from building an over 60 square foot vibrating metal plate to simulate the worms movements under the sands. And then we have a sandworm with actual in biology throat structures and all sorts of things like that. So when we see the fantastical part of it, gigantic sandworm, person surfing on top of a sandworm, it's everything around it is anchored in something that we do see in reality that is something that our brain says, yeah, that's real, that's real, that's real, that's real. So when we get to the thing that's super duper not real, we go, yeah, okay, I accept that. It creates a situation where there's just no cracks, there's no seams, there's no room for your brain to remember that you're watching an effect. You just buy into it. And likewise, when it's put in this context of a world that feels real, where the characters treat it like it's real, suddenly everything plays believable. When you put it all together, this is a fantastic piece of sci-fi and simply a great film. Very few films attempt to operate at the scope and scale and size of this film, and this one does it with near perfection. If we get to the end of this year, and this movie isn't in my top five, really my top three, that means this will have been an insane year for movies. I got a couple more things to talk about, so let's move on to the mixed aspects of the film. These aren't necessarily good or bad things. These are just questions that people usually ask or have already started asking me about the film. There's no post credit scene or anything like that, but I have had a lot of people ask me, does this movie have a satisfying conclusion or does it feel like a cliffhanger? But this movie closes out the story of the first book, whereas Dune part one was just like the halfway point of the book. So in that sense, immediately it's a more satisfying resolution to the story. And this movie very much closes out the major story arcs and character arcs that were set up in the first film. But as you get to the end of the movie, it's also very clear that they are introducing some new ideas, some new plot points for where they will go next. It plays out like from part from beginning of part one, going into this movie, we're aiming for this objective. We get here. Once we're here, we can see where we're going next. From there, let's move on to the bad. Obviously, I loved the film, so there's not much to say here, and they're essentially just nitpicks. But because there are so many characters and it's such dense storytelling, it can feel at times like we haven't seen main characters in a very long time. As you move into the third act, because there has been so much buildup to the finale, because it is so epic in scale and size, it can also feel kind of brief. In particular, this massive battle starts, it's incredible, and then there's a part where like a door opens and my brain went, oh, we're already here? Well, well that felt really quick. Right along those exact same lines later in the finale, there's a, a showdown between two major characters that the tension has been building for this point for a while, and it, it goes by real quick. It's not that every showdown needs to be this epic duel for the ages. That would get, get repetitious because we have a different duel for the ages in this finale. But given 
the emotional significance of this moment. It just felt so brief. And finally, the, the emperor and his daughter just felt underdeveloped. It seemed like they were really important. Your father was a weak man. But didn't have that much to do playing into this. And it seemed like we needed a little bit more from them to kind of explain the, the grander picture of what was going on. Let the conflict turn into war. You then bring peace. That the emperor put some of this stuff in motion. That's it. Come back this weekend. I've got more Dune Part 2 con uh, content coming. Got a spoiler review. Denny Villeneuve movies ranked and then ranking the Dune movies, the 1984 film, as well as the miniseries from sci-fi and of course the current films. Also, Dune is based off of a book and if you're like me and you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, you should check out, check out Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. You can get a free 30-day trial plus a free audiobook and they do have the Dune books over there. So if you watched the movie and went, I want to dig further into this world, you can get a free audiobook of your choice at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. Dune Part 2 is the counterbalance to all of the recent big budget blockbuster mediocrity. It's perfect on every technical level. The world feels massive in scale, but also meticulous in all of the little details. The characters are complex and compelling at the same time. It's thrilling, thought-provoking, exciting. This is everything that I want from sci-fi. It is a great film, and as I said before, it's almost guaranteed to be in my top th five, probably top three films of the year. Overall, it's an A on the entertainment scale, 9.5 out of 10, and this is a must-see movie. And remember, if you want those delicious meals delivered right to your door, check out Factor at the link down below in the description. Likewise, if you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, check out Audible at that link down below in the description, and I got more Dune content coming this weekend. Thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies and TV.